So back before break, we were talking about the ideas related to model selection. We started by discussing some aspects of the philosophy of science and talked about how uh, different philosophies of science are, are compatible with the idea of selecting between multi multiple alternative models. Um, the, these different approaches to model selection are fundamentally based on this idea of trade-offs uh, between trying to get the model that fits the data the best uh, versus the model that tries to make the best predictions. We're trying to balance um, the uncertainties in the residuals versus the other uncertainties in the models. Uh, we spent the week uh, before break talking about a number of uh, maximum likelihood based approaches to model selection, uh, focusing on specifically uh, the likelihood ratio test and the AIC metric. Uh, we also talked briefly about the, the, uh, the frequentist idea of, of p-values. Um, what I wanted to dive into today is to talk a bit about uh, Bayesian approaches to model selection, talking specifically about two information theory metrics, DIC and WAIC, and then talking about another approach called predictive loss. So as a reminder, uh, the idea of model selection is focused on choosing between multiple competing models rather than just a, a refuting of a single null model. So rather than just uh, doing an, a, a null hypothesis uh, testing, we have different models that are being considered that vary uh, in their complexity and their uncertainty. And often we use things like the number of parameters in a model as a judge of the model's complexity and uh, keep track of multiple uncertainties associated with the, the model, particularly things like the model residual errors. And the, the key idea, ideas here in model selection, one is the data is the ultimate arbiter. The data tells us which model is supported. Um, and the, this idea of parsimony. We want to make our models as simple as possible, but not simpler. So as a reminder, the likelihood ratio test uh, was based on uh, literally the ratio of, of two likelihoods, essentially giving us an, an odds of one model uh, versus the other. Um, we very often express that instead of uh, as a ratio of likelihoods, as a difference in, in log likelihoods. Um, and you know, as discussed before, you know, multiplying that log negative log likelihood by two to give us a quantity called a deviance. Uh, we talked about the fact that the deviance uh, is distributed with a chi-square distribution under some you know, deeper assumptions of normality and central limit theorem, uh, where the degrees of freedom in that chi-square distribution is the difference in the number of parameters between the models. Uh, and that kind of acts as a penalty um, on a model with more parameters. We also pointed out the, the key aspect of a, a likelihood ratio test is it is only derived um, under the idea of, of when you're testing nested models. So where your simple model is a, a version of your more complex model with certain terms set to specific values. So if you had a, a quadratic regression as your more complex model, you can make that a linear regression by putting the slope in front of the quadratic term forcing that to be zero. So that would be an example of a nested model. Uh, the likelihood ratio test is, is one of the metrics that we work with that is actually explicitly giving us a, a p-value that comes from that chi-square distribution. The other maximum likelihood metric we talked about was the AIC, which likewise includes this deviance term, the minus two log likelihood, uh, but then introduces a penalty for model complexity. And this in this case, that penalty is two times the number of parameters in the model. Um, with AIC, the lowest value wins. So you want to minimize your AIC, which is essentially minimizing your log likelihood, uh, but then applying this penalty for complexity. It does not give you a, a, a p-value, but it is expressed. You know, we often use different rules of thumbs to say whether two models are similar to each other, uh, whether they're somewhat different, 
kind of in the two to five range or you know, greater than five is usually considered strong support uh, for you know, the, 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 whichever model has the, the lowest AIC. Uh, we talked about this idea of the p-value being the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as extreme as the one that was actually observed, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, and reminded us that the p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true, uh, it is not the probability of falsely rejecting the null hypothesis, and also that it, note that it does not have uh, what was it, biological significance or, or uh, you know, disciplinary significance. So statistical significance is not necessarily the same thing as um, me, you know, scientifically meaningful. It tells us that something uh, is, uh, you know, often that we're rejecting some null hypothesis, but given enough data, you know, very, very tiny differences between two, two tests uh, could be found to be significant, even if there's not a meaningful difference between those uh, two models. Uh, an important complement to thinking about p-values that uh, actually I think extends to all models, not just uh, when we're doing uh, the calculation of p-values, is the idea of, of power. So the p-value, as a reminder, is based on trying to control the rate of false positives. So if the null hypothesis is true, we don't want to accept the alternative hypothesis uh, at a rate greater than you know, alpha over two. So we have a 95%, uh, if we have a 5% uh, acceptance criteria, you know, we don't want um, you know, more than two and a half percent false positives in one direction and two and a half false positives in the other direction. Uh, power, by contrast, is, is more about controlling the rate of false negatives. Um, so if the alternative hypothesis is true, what's the probability of uh, rejecting the null hypothesis? Um, so we want to control the rate at which we accept, we, we control the rate at which we accept the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So that would be a false negative. Uh, one thing that's important about a, a power calculation is it requires, you know, often more uh, more assumptions, and you know, we have to state some explicit alternative hypothesis that is being tested. Uh, unlike the null, where it's you know often a, a you know, an assumption of, of values that have you know often a zero slope, zero mean sort of thing. Um, so we need to know the specific parameter values in our model, the specific uncertainties, and a specific sample size to be able to estimate uh, the power of that specific alternative hypothesis. Um, it is not uncommon to calculate power as a function of sample size, which can be really helpful uh, with experimental designs. So knowing uh, when we, how, you know, what sample size that we will need to be able to control uh, power. And with the, the general problem here is that, um, you know, when we, when we fail to reject a null hypothesis, you know, that we can, that could either have been a, occur because the alternative hypothesis is false or because we didn't have sufficient sample size, basically we didn't have sufficient power to reject the null hypothesis. And it's, it's really important when we, you know, uh, if we don't find or uh, you know, if we don't reject our null hypothesis, it's very important to know did we not reject the null hypothesis because the effect isn't real, or did we not re reject it because we lacked the power to do so? Um, so, how we interpret non significant p values has a lot to do with the, the sample size. Um, and just noting that, you know, very often. You know, for very simple models, there are, are, are packages that can calculate power for things like ANOVAs and t-tests and regressions. Uh, for more complex, we usually do this through uh, numerical simulation, something that will end up looking a lot like um, a Monte Carlo simulation or a, a bootstrap. Uh, so this graphically shows this idea of power, that if we have a null hypothesis, uh, 
that is assumed to be true, we end up with uh, this idea our, our alpha, uh, our significance level controls this rate of false positives. So how often would we um, reject this null hypothesis when it's actually true? Uh, by contrast, the alternative hypothesis, the idea of power says if we have some specific alternative hypothesis um, at some rate theta, uh, we will, you know, fa you know uh, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. I guess we, yeah, so even when the alternative hypothesis is true, we don't reject the null hypothesis at this rate beta. These are uh, these false negatives. And so power just being one minus beta. So it's how often do we accept the alternative hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true? And you can see it has a lot to do with uh, the effect size, so how big is this alternative hypothesis relative to the null? So here, you know, the effect size is, you know, about three and a third, and it has a lot to do with the um, distribution around that um, effect. So if the standard error is large, we're going to have a, a large beta and low power. By contrast, if the standard error is very small, uh, we'll have uh, a very small beta and very high power. So power effect, in essence, you know, depends on the effect size, and depends on that standard error. Uh, but we also know uh, from previous parts of this class that that standard error is going to depend a lot on on sample size, as well as the, just the natural variability in the system. So systems that are naturally more variable will have a large standard deviation and uh, so we'll take a larger sample size to get this standard error small. Here's a, a bit of R code showing a generic example for how we might do uh, a power calculation. So here, in, in, and this specifically is formulated in maximum likelihood context. So assume that I have uh, some function that is my alternative model, and that function has some parameters theta, uh, and let's say I'm depending on some x and y's. So I'm trying to fit some, predict some y given some function of some set of x's that depends on some parameters. And here I've just assumed uh, normal error, but this could be any likelihood. So I have a, a, a likely, a log likelihood function uh, for my alternative model, and then I have a log likelihood function for my null model. So here I just have a, a standard normal with uh, a constant mean and a constant standard deviation. Oops. Um, so the idea in this idea of numerically simulating power is we set up a loop over some number of simulations. It'll likely be thousands, similar to what we do for, for MCMC um, or for bootstrapping when we need large samples. You know, we start by assuming the alternative model is true. So we you know, uh, calculate what the alternative model would predict for a specific set of parameters, theta, and we predict, we generate uh, pseudo data um, under that specific set of parameters with some specific sample size and um, standard deviation. So essentially these two first two steps are exactly the same as what we would do in a parametric bootstrap. We're assuming the model is true, we simulate data from that true model. Uh, we now fit the true alternative model, but we also fit the null model. So in, indeed, these first three steps are exactly the same as uh, the parametric bootstrap, because in the parametric bootstrap, we would fit that likelihood, and we'd save, uh, example, we'd save the parameters to get their distribution. Uh, here, we're also uh, fitting the null model, though. So that's the, the difference here. We're fitting the model we're interested in, the alternative model. We're fitting the null model. Uh, and then we're calculating our model selectric metric. In this case, I'm uh, calculating a likelihood ratio test uh, between you know, the, ratio, the ratio of this likelihood, the alternative likelihood, the ratio of the null likelihood. I have that two in there. And I use this chi-squared distribution for the likelihood ratio test. Uh, 
I'll point out that you could do this sort of Monte, uh, Monte Carlo power simulation under any of our model selectric met metrics. We just, instead of calculating a p-value here, we might calculate, um, you know, say the uh, AIC for the um, alternative model and the AIC for the null model and record uh, whether the, the alternative was bigger than the null. Uh, or we could record those AICs and do some analyses of the, th their difference post hoc. Um, and then here in this last line, I'm calculating the power. So I'm, I'm summing up how often my p-value was significant out of the number of simulations I did. So here's an example of what we might get out of that sort of analysis. Again, I'm gonna look at uh, this case we've been using in the past where we have uh, a true model that happens to be quadratic with sim data simulated around it. We then fit um, a constant mean linear model, quadratic model, and cubic model to that. And here's a, specifically a power analysis for this specific sample size and specific uh, model uh, choice, comparing the, the quadratic model to the linear model. So, you know, I would go and I'd fit the quadratic model to simulate data. I'd fit the linear model of simulated data, I'd use a likelihood ratio test to say, you know, do I uh, reject the hypothesis that the null model is the true model and save those p-values? And since I do this thousands of times, I'd get thousands of estimates of p-value for thousands of different simulated data sets that are like my original data, uh, but different. Uh, because they're simulated. And here I would see in, in this particular case for that sample size and that alternative model uh, that I actually rejected the null hypothesis 100% of the time, suggesting that um, in this case, the sample size uh, is definitely sufficient uh, to reject the, um, the linear hypothesis. And just as a reminder that because we're doing this under a specific set of model parameters uh, choosing to simulate the data in terms of the, the, its means and its uh, uncertainties, you know, a power analysis is going to be specific to the parameter values and sample size that is chosen. Okay, so now moving on to our uh, Bayesian approaches to model selection. Uh, and before I dive into DIC, the deviance information criteria, I want to kind of present uh, some of you know, probably the, the first starting point, which is why can't we just use the same information criteria that we used for maximum likelihood? Well, if you think about something like the AIC, the AIC is based on um, the deviance at the maximum likelihood value. It's, it's assuming that you have a single best parameter set and you calculate um, the deviance at that single best um, parameter set. Now in, in Bayes, you know, we don't have a single value uh, for the deviance. We could calculate the deviance for every single different parameter set in the posterior. So we'd have a whole distribution of deviances. Um, and so if we look at it, the DIC, you can see that the first term in the DIC is, is actually that uh, expected number, that expected value of the, the deviance. So we're actually, instead of calculating uh, the deviance at the most likely parameters, we're calculating the mean deviance averaging over the full posterior distribution of our parameters. Um, so it's just that sample mean. Now, similar to AIC, we will want some penalty for the complexity of the model. Um, and in the AIC, we penalize it just based on the actual number of parameters in the model. Um, and in DIC, we're gonna use something slightly different, but related, which is a, a calculation of the effective number of parameters in a model. And uh, I'll talk about in the next slide, uh, why we have this idea of an effective number of parameters. And it, it comes back to the idea that in, in, there are some Bayesian model structures, such as hierarchical models, uh, where the, the actual true number of parameters is not uh, obvious. 
and, and actually could depend on the, the data. Um, DIC is not the only Bayesian uh, model selection metric out there, but it's one that is particularly popular because it is one that is easily calculated uh, from our MCMC output. And in fact, I would argue that one of the main reasons that DIC has become very popular was that uh, when Bugs, the original Bayesian, uh, generalized Bayesian software uh, came out, it had a button to calculate DIC. Um, so you could calculate this model selector metric by clicking on a button and any other metric you'd had to calculate by hand. Uh, similarly with, with JAGS, there's a, a simple function we'll see uh, that calculates DIC for you. Um, and so it became a metric that was, uh, that continued to be used in JAGS. Uh, these are just these last bullet points noting what we've already talked about that we're averaging over the parameter distribution rather than just using the single maximum. Uh, and that it has this strength uh, that it's applicable when the number of parameters uh, in a model is ambiguous. Uh, like with the AIC, the lowest score wins. And like with the AIC, we tend to use the same rules of thumb for when um, a DIC value is, uh, shows, uh, is a bit ambiguous in terms of which model wins versus when you see weak support versus strong support. Uh, to explain what, where and when the effective number of parameters in a model can be ambiguous, I'm going to introduce briefly the idea of a hierarchical model, which we'll dive into in much more detail uh, in a couple weeks. So the easiest way to understand a hierarchical model is to contrast it to its uh, two end members in, in a suite of, of possible solutions. So imagine that I have, in this case, three data sets, Y1, Y2, and Y3. And my model is something as simple as calculating a mean. You can conceptually explain, expand this concept to more complex models. But just to keep things simple, imagine that you are calculating mean. If you have three data sets, you have two alternatives here. You can calculate the mean across all three data sets, ignoring any source of variability uh, across those three data sets. They might represent three different years or three different uh, plots or three different blocks or watersheds or lakes or whatever your unit of measure are. You know, in, in the common mean version, we ignore whatever variability uh, there is between these three different data sets and just calculate a mean over them. On the other extreme, uh, we might assume that you know that these three different data sets come from three different sources, you know, and so we're going to calculate uh, means for them separately. And you could also see that you could easily do uh, model selection between these two alternatives. So let's also assume that there is some estimate of standard deviation here. And so, you know, under the common mean model, you'd have two parameters, a mean and standard deviation, and an independent model, you'd have six parameters, uh, three means and three standard deviations, and um, the number of parameters is clear, and you know you could calculate the uh, deviances for these, the, and you'd expect the deviance under the independent model to be lower because it's a more complex model. Um, even if the differences between these three data sets are just due to noise, you would still uh, fit them better. Uh, and so the question would then be, you know, which is the better fit? Now, instead of just being restricted to the two end members, uh, let's consider an, uh, an intermediate case where instead of assuming, uh, so, so in this middle case of hierarchical models, we're going to assume a structure like the independent model where each, um, each site gets its own fit to its own mean. So here I have a theta one, a theta two, and theta three, which are the means of the data set for Y1, Y2, and Y3. But unlike the independent data set, I'm not gonna assume that these mu's, in this case, these thetas, 
are, are actually independent of each other. So in the independent fit, they were completely separate fit. There's no shared information. You know, there's no, you know, nothing about data sets two and three tell me anything about what's going on data set one. They're just completely different things. In a hierarchical model, we might say uh, there are going to be different means between these three different data sets, uh, but they are related to each other. So there might be some overall global mean uh, and, and global standard deviation. And the global standard deviation now tells me about how different these three data sets are from each other. Um, and so we kind of have combined the common mean of having an overall estimate uh, and an estimate of, of data set to data set variability with independent estimates. So like I said, you have, with the common mean model, you have two parameters. Within an independent model, you have six parameters. And now with a hierarchical model, it's ambiguous how many parameters we have. It's somewhere uh, between two parameters at the minimum, the global mean and its standard deviation, and eight parameters, where I also have a mean and standard deviation for theta one, theta two, and, and theta three. Uh, why do we not automatically have eight parameters for theta one, two, and three? Well, it's because the theta, the theta one, two, and three, their means are not independent of each other. They're dependent on mu. And if there's very small site-to-site -site variability, um, they're very similar and, and you know, very correlated in essence. So they're, they're not independent. Um, and so if the data says that these things are very similar to each other, um, then the, the effective number of parameters is going to be close to two. Uh, by contrast, if these three data sets are very, very different from each other, there's going to be a lot of site-to-site -site variability. Uh, they're behaving very similar to as if they were independent, and the effective number of parameters will then end up uh, near this upper bound. So it's, it's actually uh, the data sets themselves help kind of determine the effective number of parameters to kind of tell us how independent these data sets are from each other. So the same model structure could give us different estimates of effective uh, numbers of parameters. So as I alluded to, uh, one of the things that's made DIC a popular model selection metric is its ease of calculation. Uh, within JAGS, there's a simple function, DIC samples. We pass in our compiled JAGS model, same as we would do with uh, CODA samples or something like that. The number of iterations we want to run for the calculation of DIC and some optional parameters that usually don't need to be invoked. Uh, under the hood, what's going to happen is that uh, every MCMC iteration, uh, JAGS will calculate and store the deviance just by calculating uh, the log likelihood. And then after uh, the MCMC is complete, it's going to calculate the posterior means for your parameters, then calculate your deviance at those posterior means, um, and then calculate the mean of the deviance across all those MCMC samples, and then it will calculate the DIC as twice the mean deviance minus the deviance at the mean. And, and that's because um, if we jump back, the effective sample size was essentially calculated as the mean deviance minus the deviance at the mean. And remember that those things are not the, not the same because of Jensen's inequality. So, you know, if we think about Jensen's inequality, the, the, the more linear the model, the, you know, the, uh, the more linear the likelihood, uh, the more uh, these two become similar to each other, the smaller the effective sample size. Okay. Cool. And this shows an example of applying this to this uh, same example parameter set, uh, the same example simulated data set that we've talked about before, uh, where we can see um, 
the calculation of the DIC, the calculation of the effective samples, effective number of parameters, and the calculation of the delta DIC, which is just subtracting the best value, which in this case is the quadratic, uh, off of the others. And so we can see uh, the quadratic uh, does, there's strong support for the quadratic over the linear model over the, over the constant model. And we see that the, there's weak support for choosing the quadratic over the cubic. And these, these numerical results are very, very similar to what we got uh, for our uh, AIC calculation with the same model. We also see that the calculation of effective samples, effective number of parameters is very similar to the calculation uh, of the true number of parameters in this model. Uh, based on its complexity. So we know that, you know, in the flat model, we just have a mean and variance. So there's two, the linear has three, a slope intercept and a variance, quadratic has four, and the cubic is five. So the effective number of parameter calculation is very similar. And really the, you know, the noise in that, um, and with, the, with the larger sample size, these will probably get closer and closer to the two, three, four, and five. And it really doesn't actually change, the little bit of round off in here doesn't really change our answer. Um, more recently, a, a newer Bayesian model selection metric has, has been gaining popular popularity uh, called uh, WAIC. Uh, the uh, Watanabe Akeaki uh, information criteria, uh, which is a, a, a generalization of AIC to a, to a fully Bayesian context. Uh, now the calculation of WAC initially looks scarier than uh, AIC or DIC, because we have this minus two sum log and then this, this ugly integral. Uh, but what's going on in this, this integral? Well, let's, if we go back and look at um, how we defined uh, the posterior predictive distribution that this integral right here is essentially that definition. It's our, it's our definition of, of our posterior predictive distribution. And so this is very much a fully Bayesian analog to the calculation of log likelihood. So instead of calculating minus two log of the likelihood, we're now calculating minus two log of the posterior predictive probability. Um, so we're now, instead of just using a likelihood, we're actually using the posterior predictive distribution. Uh, and then like with the other information criteria metrics, we then have a penalty uh, for model complexity. Um, and in this case, that penalty comes in um, as the sum of the variance over uh, the log likelihood. So this you know, probability of the data given the model, again, is just our, our likelihood. Uh, while this looks scarier, we'll note that both elements in this sum can be approximated using MCMC samples. So to see an example of how we might do that and to compare uh, conceptually DIC and WAIC, let's consider in the box, in this black box here, uh, a simple uh, logistic regression model. So in the logistic regression model, uh, we assume uh, a Bernoulli data model. So remember logistic regression is when our y's are just gonna be zeros and ones. This is uh, analogous to the uh, maturation model we've seen in previous labs. Um, and the Bernoulli is just equivalent to a binomial with a sample size of one. Uh, in the logistic regression, we have a, a linear model, uh, say a beta one intercept, a beta two slope times some x, uh, transformed through the logit transform. And so that's kind of a sigmoidally shaped function. Uh, very, so this is very analogous to the probit model we had looked at before. Um, and then we down at the bottom here in this box, we have some priors on beta. So that 
so everything in black would just be the the normal vanilla logistic regression model um, as you do as you would write it even if you weren't calculating information theory criteria um, what I've added here in red is an explicit calculation of the likelihood so I'm now calculating uh, the binomial distribution of the observed data uh, given the same prediction, so it's the same prediction as we're using for uh, in the data model uh, with a sample size of one. Again, just that the sample size uh, in the Bernoulli is the same as, uh, sorry, the sample size, the Bernoulli is the same as the binomial with a sample size of, of one. The key thing you'll notice that's different and in fact, I could have written this up here as my uh, as my data model. Um, the key difference here actually is this arrow. So here, instead of assuming the y is distributed according to that Bernoulli distribution, I'm now treating this as an analytical analytical calculation. So I'm actually assigning uh, the value of that likelihood function to this variable, which I'm calling like, and I'm doing it for each of the data, um, each, of, each data point. So what's going to end up in my MCMC output is a, is a table where each uh, row is a iteration of the MCMC and each column is the calculation of likelihood at that particular data point. Okay, so let's say we have that model and then we go back up to the, this Outside of the box, we start by um, fitting our JAGS model, uh, same as we normally would do. We you now take our use CODA samples to take our samples. And here I'm just making sure that that parameter like, uh, which is our, our likelihood calculation, is among the things being spit out in CODA samples. In practice, I also want to make sure that I'm spitting out my. Uh, beta one and beta two, because that's actually what I'm getting from fitting the model. That's what I'm interested in. Uh, to calculate DIC, I would use the DIC samples uh, function where I'd pass in the JAGS model and the number of iterations. And then I just, you know, the output of that will tell me what the mean deviation and that penalty of effective uh, sample size is. Uh, for the WAIC, we have to do a little bit more of the calculation ourselves, but um, it's relatively straightforward. So this first step here is just taking all those values of, of like and combining the samples from different chains. In this case, uh, they had two chains. Um, next, we're calculating the, the mean of the likelihood for each of those columns. So at each of the uh, data points, we calculate the mean likelihood over the MCMC samples. Uh, next, we're calculating that penalty. So we're taking the, the likelihood, we're taking the log, so we now get a log likelihood. And then we're taking the variance uh, for each of those columns. Uh, so we've now calculated the mean likelihood for each column. We've now calculated the variance of the likelihood for each column. In PW, we sum up uh, all of those variances. And then in the WAC, uh, we're summing up the log of all of those uh, means. So we take that mean likelihood, we, we take the log of that, and we sum up that over each of the data points. Uh, so we have, yeah, so we end up with that minus two sum of the logs of the posterior predictive values of the likelihoods and some of the uh, sorry, some of the variances in, in that log likelihood. Cool. Uh, since WAC is a new metric, I actually have not had a chance to go back and, and uh, calculate it for that same set of uh, candidate models that we'd been talking about in the uh, previous examples. So I hope to do that in a future lecture. The Next Bayesian model selection metric I want to talk about uh, is called predictive loss. And predictive loss is interesting because it doesn't 
uh, rely on an information theory criteria. Uh, it instead goes back to the conceptual idea that we had before of uh, the trade-off and the different uncertainties between predictive uncertainties and residual uncertainties and actually just calculates those things explicitly. So it involves uh, two things, G and P, and, and G is our total residual sum of squares, and so the uh, G divided by N would just be our residual variance, and square root of that would just be our root mean squared error. Um, and so, as we've discussed previously, as we increase model complexity, uh, this residual error will just keep going down and down and down. Uh, and then P is just our total predictive variance. So, um, you know, if I you know, divide that by N, I have the, the mean predictive variance, and I could take the square root of that and get the uh, root mean predictive error. So they, would, they, they are on the same scale. And so essentially, this is telling me how confident I am about predictions with this model uh, in, in the future versus how well uh, we're explaining the residual error. And so now we're explicitly providing that penalty for making bad predictions. And, and so G will keep going down as the model uh, complexity increases. Uh, P will initially go down as the model in, in complexity increases uh, because the more complex models are likely to, to fit the data model data better. But then uh, P will start increasing again as model complexity increases too much because the uh, uncertainties, the total uncertainties in the model, for example, the fact that the parameter error is going up uh, will more than compensate for the reduction in residual error. Um, so typically, you know, we think about predictive losses. We are given some set of ob observed Ys. We want to predict to some new Ys, Y rep. Uh, in practice, we often do this uh, for the same points as we made observations. Uh, that you could also calculate a predictive loss metric in a truly predictive set sense to some out of sample data. Ah. Um, and things that I like about predictive loss is it's like with the other metrics, it is easy, easily calculated from our MCMC metric, but it's explicitly focused on prediction. It, it actually doesn't have kind of an information theory derivation. It's just saying, you know, that in practice, what we want to do is, is make good predictions. Um, we want to minimize that predictive error. Uh, so we don't actually need to calculate any sort of estimate of model dimension. It's the it's the predictive uncertainty that acts as a penalty, not complex complexity. Though we know that the two are related. So if we go back to this figure that we're that I'd used in a previous lecture to explain the basic trade-offs that are present in any model selection selection metric, we can see that that the predictive loss components are explicit in this figure. So, you know, if I increased the number of parameters in, in say, a linear model such that the residual error will keep going down asymptotically uh, till it eventually hits zero when the number of parameters uh, is the same as the number of data points, we can see that this, that parameter G, the resi residual sum of squares divided by N is just this residual variance that I was, that was minimizing. Uh, in P, uh, the total variance or total predictive variance, uh, I was, you know, in this figure expressing it, you know, on a uh, per data point basis, you know, that that predictive variance just keeps going up. And so in, in predictive loss, you're just saying, okay, let's, uh, let's minimize the sum of the two of them. There's actually a, a more generalized version of predictive loss where you might choose to weight uh, one of them uh, more or less. So, so I guess it's sometimes the, the residual error is given a lower weight than predictive error. Um, in practice, uh, the, the, the model you choose tends to not be hugely sensitive to how you weight the two, provided that 
uh, you're weighting the residual error less than the predictive error, lesser than or equal to the predictive error. Uh, so putting this into practice, as you go through the MCMC, uh, for every MCMC iteration, you would want to generate pseudo-data at the same points as the original data. Um, Otherwise, that's equivalent to how we're doing our, our predictive interval calculation. And in fact, you could use this uh, output to, to generate your predictive intervals. You just want to make sure that you've sorted your X data uh, in order so that you're not getting you know, just zigzaggy predictive intervals. Um, after you've run the MCMC, uh, from that posterior predictive distribution, you would calculate uh, the posterior mean uh, at each data point. Um, so, yeah, what, what's the posterior mean predictive? Calculate the residual uh, variance at each point, so the difference between the predictive mean and the, what was observed. And uh, it's, yeah, you want to sum up the predictive variance over all points, and then you'd want to uh, su you know sum up the residual errors at each point. Cool. And so here I've applied the this predictive loss metric to the, again that uh, quadratic example, um, and here noting again that the square root of p and g divided by n are the predicted standard deviation and residual standard deviation respectively. Uh, as expected, uh, the residual error keeps going down as we increase model complexity, that the cubic model in fact does have a lower residual error than the quadratic model, uh, even though in this case the quadratic error model is, is actually the true one. Uh, but when we look at the predictive error, we see that the predictive error uh, goes down from the flat to the linear to the quadratic, but then it goes back up from the quadratic to the cubic. So uh, the cubic model is uh, has higher predictive variance than the quadratic because the additional complexity of adding that cubic term uh, induces more parameter error to the predictions than it explains residual error. And so the overall uh, balance of these two you know, provides support for the, uh, the quadratic model. Uh, predictive loss, like the other uh, Bayesian metrics we've looked at, does not provide uh, an explicit p-value. Um, I want to talk about a few other uh, things related to Bayesian model selection that, that just want to touch on quickly because they come up in the literature. Um, one is this idea of Bayes factors and Bayes factors um, are actually based on um, calculating the posterior probability of alternative models. Here we have the posterior odds of model one relative to model two, uh, normalized by the prior odds of model one versus model two. Uh, Bayes factors um, do explicitly require assigning a prior probability to each model structure. Um, in practice, base factors can be somewhat harder to calculate. Uh, it's not as simple as using your existing MCMC output. Um, and I think because of that, uh, while base factors were initially uh, really interesting to folks, they have, I've tended not to see them used as much uh, recently. Uh, and there is some evidence that suggests they tend to select models that are too simple asymptotically. But that, uh, I think, is far less the reason that you, I think the, the difficulty of calculation is the reason we don't see them used uh, as much. Um, another thing, uh, somewhat similar, uh, but, but uh, much more uh, in use these days, is this idea of, of reversible jump MCMC. Uh, reversible jump MCMC, like likelihood ratio tests, works with a set of nested models. So there's some set of uh, models, and you know you can make the simpler one by fixing, uh, you know, parameters uh, in a simpler model, so essentially dropping terms. Uh, and so in a reversible jump MCMC, uh, not only are you um, proposing uh, specific uh, 
values for parameters as the MCMC progresses, you also will, will propose to add or remove terms in your model within the MCMC. So they'll, you know, for example, if you have you know, a linear model versus a quadratic model, you might propose, let's say you, you have the quadratic model, you might have some, uh, uh, metropolis hasing steps that proposes uh, dropping the uh, quadratic term uh, to bring you back to linear term. And then if you're at the linear term, you might have some proposal to drop down uh, to the constant mean term, but you might have some proposal to go back to the quadratic term. And so you'll actually end up uh, generating the posterior probability for each model in addition uh, to having parameter estimates for each of those models. Uh, and then you know, when we make predictions, we would want to we would want to average over those models. Uh, this brings me to another uh, concept that you know instead of uh, selecting models, there's also this Bayesian idea of of model averaging. Uh, and the the idea of Bayesian model averaging is more general than uh, reversal jump MCMC because it doesn't require uh, nested models. It just requires that we make predictions uh, using uh, a whole suite of models rather than uh, actually choosing between them, but that we weight the different models based on their posterior probabilities. So in this figure, we might, we're envisioning making predictions with one, two, three, four, five different models, but we can see that two of them are getting low weight, two of them are getting intermediate weight, and one of them is getting a higher weight. So the, mo the model with the highest weight uh, is contributing most to the uh, ensemble uh, posterior prediction. But these two that have intermediate weight that are very similar are giving us a, you know, kind of another mode to the posterior predictive distribution. So you get an overall posterior predictive distribution that, that combines multiple models, each weighted by its own uh, probability. Uh, finally, I wanted to point folks to um, a nice paper uh, it came out a year or two ago uh, by Mevin Hooten and Tom Hobbs, uh, who wrote this paper in Ecological Monographs, that's specifically on uh, the different approaches to, to Bayesian uh, model selection, model averaging. Uh, so you can see that the things that we've talked about here, uh, WAC, DIC, predictive loss, AIC, uh, as well as uh, model averaging, reversal jump MCMC, and Bayes factors are, are actually a subset of the different approaches that are, that, you know, are actually out there and, and being used in literature. Um, and I think this um, paper does a nice job of showing how these different approaches are, are related to each other, um, showing that some of our, uh, our WAC, DIC, predictive loss, and AIC fall within this general conceptual framework of regularization, which is that, again, that idea of uh, constraining uh, the statistical calibration problem with some penalty or shrinkage, and that we've, we've specifically been focusing here on what we'd call within sample uh, validation approaches. So we're, we're uh, choosing between alternative models based solely on the data uh, that was used to fit the models. Uh, and that there, this is one alternative and there's also alternatives to such as cross-validation and out-of-sample validation. Uh, and that there are also other model-based sele model selection approaches other than Bayes factors, reversal jump, jump MCMC and model averaging. Uh, in practice, I, I am a huge, huge proponent of out-of-sample validation when you do have genuine out-of-sample data. Um, that it is a very important and strong test of a model and, and should be done whenever possible. Uh, I will say that in practice, um, I find that cross-validation is not used as frequently in Bayesian approaches as it is often used in maximum likelihood or frequentist approaches. Uh, though it is used, um, I think one of the challenges to cross-validation in Bayes is that you have to fit uh, models repeatedly, and so the computational cost of fitting a model 
uh, goes up when you have to refit it many, many times. Uh, I also find it you know, a little bit ambiguous when you do that in a Bayesian context. You know, now instead of having one posterior, you have n posteriors, and the question of which posterior you actually use uh, can be somewhat ambiguous. So to wrap up, uh, over the course of this semester, we now know how to fit models to data using both maximum likelihood and Bayes. Uh, we know how to construct confidence intervals. We know how to test hypotheses and compare between models, and we know how to make predictions that propagate those uncertainties in models. So we've really, at this point, laid the full conceptual foundation uh, for the rest of the semester. Uh, and so what's left? You know, we, we've kind of covered our theoretical bases. So what's really left is uh, using and building upon these theoretical uh, concepts uh, to explore uh, progressively more complicated models, so starting from simple things like linear models and, and progressively relaxing their assumptions um, to see how to actually approach uh, a range of different types of real-world problems applying these, these concepts. Uh, so with that, we'll move on to uh, more complex models. Thanks.